Let's play a little guessing game. I'm going to name the sites you have on your bucket list. Machu Picchu, the Colosseum, Petra, Taj Mahal. Did I get at least one of them right? I have to confess, I was just taking them off the list of the new seven wonders of the world. It was officially finished in 2007 after a worldwide vote. What happened to the old list? Well, it was put together in the second century BCE. And there is just one site currently still standing, the Pyramids of Giza. Pack your bags. We're going to Peru, the home of the mighty Machu Picchu. When it was first discovered in 1911, its explorer thought he had managed to find the lost city of the Inca. Several decades later, it turned out it wasn't the same city. Plus, there were still three farmer families living there, so it couldn't be really called lost and forgotten. No wonder they like it so much there. The stones making up the buildings are cut so precisely and sit together so tightly that you can't even insert a credit card between them. It has saved the city from some serious earthquakes, which are common here. The buildings just dance through all the shaking and then go back into place. And because of the way it's arranged, you can see the sun rise or set exactly behind the important peaks on important days for the Inca. More than half, 60% of all the construction in Machu Picchu was done underground, so you can't even see it. The best part is that there are still things to be discovered if you want to get your name inked in history. Our next stop is on the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. The mighty Chichen Itza sits here for well over 1,500 years. The structure has exactly 365 steps. You can count when you go next time if you don't trust me. The Maya, who built the whole thing, were really into astronomy. So it's not surprising they made as many steps as there are days in a year. Also, if you happen to be here during the spring or fall equinox, you'll notice the shadows the setting sun casts make it look like there's a snake going down the stairs. The feathered serpent was one of the main deities in ancient Mexico. Chichen Itza used to be a busy urban center. It had its ups and downs. And by the time the Spanish arrived the 16th century, it had been mostly abandoned. The first photos we have from the spot are from the end of the 19th century. Looks like the terraced pyramid had a lot more vegetation on it back in 1892. The only source of fresh water in this dry climate is the cenotes, or water-filled sinkholes. There are four visible cenotes, and the temple pyramid most likely stands on top of one more. Archaeologists are looking for tunnels to enter it. To see our next wonder, you must be prepared to share it with around 15,000 others. That's how many people visit the statue of Christ the Redeemer every day. The statue sits above the Corcovado mountain and weighs roughly 635 tons. Must have been tricky to lift it all the way up there. Actually, it came in parts. A French sculptor, Paul Landowski, made several pieces of the future sculpture out of clay. The head and the hands were made in full size and the body would be made larger on the spot. The parts of the statue were cut into cubes and then cast into concrete and put together. Workers prepared the cement right on the spot and transferred all the tools by a small cogwheel railroad which tourists used to get up the hill. The statue is the best proof that lightning does strike in the same place more than once. It must be because of its position on top of the mountain, its fingers, head and eyebrows got damaged by storms. Time to move on. This time, we're going to Agra, India. Yep, to see the Taj Mahal, that beautiful pink construction. Wait, wasn't it always white? Well, the Taj Mahal changes its color depending on what time it is. It looks pale pink or pearly gray at sunrise, crystal white at noon, and the sunset paints it orange bronze. In the evening, it may even seem translucent blue. And that's not the only optical illusion here. When you move towards the main gate, the building seems gigantic, but the closer you get to it, the smaller it looks. The minarets, or towers on both sides, might seem to be standing perfectly straight, but in reality, they're leaning outward. It's done for aesthetic balance, and also to prevent the towers from falling on the main building in case of an earthquake. For construction finished in the 17th century, the Taj Mahal looks good as new. That's because it regularly gets a spa day, 
they apply a proper facial mud pack to it, which is a traditional recipe to keep the radiance. I'm feeling peckish from all the traveling. How about we go to Italy and have some pasta? Just kidding. The real reason would be to see the Colosseum, of course. Its original name was the Flavian Amphitheater because it was built by the Flavian Dynasty. The new name is most likely after the colossal bronze statue of Emperor Nero that was once next to the building. The model for the statue was the Colossus of Rhodes. In its nearly 2,000 years, the Colosseum has lived through at least three major fires and four earthquakes. It was damaged, repaired, and rebuilt many times. The impressive construction once hosted up to 80,000 spectators. What they watched wasn't necessarily as cruel as Hollywood made us believe. Most gladiator matches went under strict rules. <sighs> Sometimes the public would get bored with the show, and the participants would draw out of the arena. Once the Colosseum stopped serving as an arena for those scary shows, it was used as a cemetery, a place of worship, for housing, workshops for artisans and merchants, the home of a religious order, and a fortified castle. Now it's open to the public, and you can check out its underground labyrinth. Are you ready for the next wonder? It's the lost city of Petra, or rather, the rediscovered city, which was once super rich and vibrant, then got abandoned and found again in 1812. The whole city is made of sandstone, and even though it's in the desert, it has seen some pretty heavy rains. Still, it has lasted 2,000 years thanks to some very skilled workers. Modern laser scanning showed that they put giant steps into the mountain to check the quality of the rock and carve out the buildings without risking their lives. And how did people survive here in the desert without any water? The Nabataeans who lived here developed a whole complicated system of conduits, dams and cisterns to make sure they have enough vital fluid for the whole year. In case you're in your Indiana Jones mode, there's still a lot to discover here in Petra. Archaeologists believe we only know 15% of the city by now, and the rest is still hidden underground. Let's finish our tour with the largest human-made project in the world. Yep, I'm talking about the Great Wall of China. It stretches for over 13,000 miles from the Bohai Sea in the east all the way to the Gobi Desert in the west. But don't trust the popular myth. You won't really see the wall from the moon. It took over 2,000 years to finish, and a good amount of building materials, mostly bricks and cut stone blocks. Have you ever scratched your name on a tree or even worse, some famous place? No worries, I won't tell anyone. People who built the wall did the same. Some of the bricks, which are mostly from the Ming Dynasty, have some data like production location, brick household name, and the responsible officials. This was a form of quality control. If something happened to any of the bricks, it would be easy to find out who to blame for it. Can you tell me what date it is today? Piece of cake. You just look at your smartphone and voila, you immediately know the day, month, and year. But was it always this easy to tell the date? Did the ancient people even have the concept of a year that lasts 365 days? Yes and no. Mayan calendars had cycles. That's close to what we call a year. But the Mayan cycle was much longer. 819 days. And this is where the mystery begins. 819 days compared to what? When does this calendar begin and when does it end? Scientists were asking themselves this question for decades. They discovered and deciphered the Mayan calendar during the 1940s. Recently, two American scientists, John Linden and Victoria Bricker, came forward with a solution. So, what did they do differently from their predecessors? The duo deciphered the code by broadening their thinking they expanded the calendar from 819 days to full 45 years. That's 20 times longer than the original cycle. And a pattern started to emerge. This was a major breakthrough because the Maya told time in a complicated way. You can forget about the easy to read Arabic numerals we have today. These ancient people used glyphs. These are tiny images that represent characters. Something like the icons on your desktop or universal symbols. When you see a little dot with three curved lines above it, you know there is a Wi-Fi network available. The Mayan calendar used glyphs that represented animals or natural phenomena. For example, there were symbols for a jaguar and an eagle. Each glyph marked one day. 
Each cycle is repeated four times, 8 and 19 x 4. Let's call these four cycles blocks. The Mayas colored each block differently. Scientists thought these colors corresponded to the four cardinal directions. Red was east, white, north. West was black and finally, yellow marked south. But then the 1980s came. Yeah, this was a weird decade. The calculations were all wrong. Researchers determined that the colors were associated with the position of the sun in the sky. It turned out that the color yellow represented the highest point of the sun, which is called a zenith. White was the lowest point, called the nadir. It seems that the calendar showed just how good the ancient Mayas were at astronomy. This is most evident at Chichen Itza. This principal Mayan city is located on the Yucatan Peninsula, Mexico. There stands an impressive step pyramid. It is dedicated to the feathered serpent deity, and its alignment is perfect. Something marvelous happens here twice a year, during the equinoxes, March and September. These are the times when the sun shines directly over the equator. On these two dates, the day and night last the same. At the site of the pyramid, sunlight first illuminates the sculpture of the serpent head at the base of the structure. Then it makes its way up the 91 steps. This creates the illusion that a snake is slithering down the pyramid. Even today, people gather to witness the site. And it must have been more impressive when the Mayas completed the structure 1050-1300 CE. Do you know what a synodic period is? Neither do I. But Mayan astronomers did. A synodic period is the time that passes before a stellar body does a full lap. For example, this is the period between two full moons. When you look from Earth, this period lasts roughly 30 days. And the Mayas were looking at the skies non-stop. They carefully noted the synodic periods of all planets. From Venus to Saturn, these ancient astronomers kept records of nearly all celestial bodies. But what does this have to do with their calendar? The American researchers' calculations revealed the link. Let's take the planet closest to the Sun as an example, Mercury. Its synodic period is 117 days. Multiply that by 7 and you get which number? Exactly 8 to 19, 117 x7 equals sign 819. Coincidence? Definitely not. Because synodic periods of other planets also neatly match the magical figure, 819. But this is not visible from a single Mayan cycle. Scientists had to expand it several times to discover the pattern. There is a reason why no one could decipher the code for so long. They were focused on a single planet. The trick was to add the Mayan calculation for all the planets. Researchers just needed to see the bigger picture. This brings us to the year 2012. Can you remember that some people thought that the world would end on December 21st? That turned out to be a bust. We are alive and well now. But what started this false rumor? The Mayan calendar, of course. You see, these ancient people based their calendar on long periods of all the planets. That included a lot of complicated math and a lot of multiplying. This 2012 was simply the time when their cycle ended. It is known as the long count. This period is the same as our year. For the Mayas, 2012 was something like the 31st of December for us. Just an end of a cycle in which they measured time, so there was no need to panic. Those New Year's Eve parties might be a bit wild, but the world doesn't end on January 1st. The Mayas stretched more than their calendar. Rubber was the name of the game. Yes, you've heard it correctly. These ancient people were making different grades of rubber 3,000 years before one famous American did, Charles Goodyear. They would extract natural latex from the rubber tree. This is a milky substance that can be turned into rubber. And they weren't the only ones. Scientists found evidence that their neighbors, the Aztecs and the Olmecs, did the same. But what did they do with rubber? They didn't need car tires, definitely. But it's cool to have a nice pair of sandals for the beach. The Spanish wrote about rubber sole footwear that natives wore. Sadly, scientists still haven't found them. That would be a big step for archaeology. So the Maya were playful with rubber, literally. Researchers guessed that they produced balls from latex. These were bouncy and ranged in size from a softball to a soccer ball. A typical Mayan ball game, pits, involved two hoops. You must be thinking basketball, but not quite. The hoops were set on walls, 23 feet high. Compare that to the NBA standard of 10 feet. And the hoop was the other way around. There is also a sweet side to the story of the Mayas. These ancient people enjoyed chocolate. In fact, the modern word chocolate probably comes from their language, socolatl. This meant bitter water, 
Okay, you get the bitter part, but why water? The Mayas didn't produce chocolate in the form we know it today. They didn't make bars of chocolate, they drank it. Smashed cocoa beans made for excellent drinks. The Mayas perfected the mixture over time and even added spices. Anyone up for a fiery chocolate drink with stew peppers and cornmeal? Who knows, maybe this beverage actually tasted well. Cocoa beans were sacred and used as a currency. Researchers believe all social classes got to enjoy it. Free chocolate for all sounds nice even today. But where did the Mayas get clean water for their cocoa drinks? From the oldest known filtration system in the Western Hemisphere. It was based on zeolite. These are minerals that contain aluminum and silicone compounds. And guess what? Modern air and water purifiers still use this material. Mayan tech wins yet again. Back in Europe, Roger Bacon developed a sand filtration system in 1627, some 1,800 years after the Mayas. But what about regions without rivers, lakes, or springs? Mayan engineers had it all figured out. Rainwater. They would carve out large reservoirs in the limestone bedrock. Then, they would coat these underground caves with a layer of a watertight material. The final step was to make small channels that collected water from the hills above. Scientists estimated that just one of these reservoirs could hold on average 10,000 gallons of rainwater, enough to fill 55 modern hot tubs. What if I told you you just won a round-the-world trip to visit the planet's most famous landmarks? Nice, right? But there's a catch. You might be visiting them for the last time in your life. That's because these landmarks are threatened to disappear during your lifetime. Yikes! Ah, Paris. The City of Love. For our modern eyes, it's hard to imagine the city without its most famous landmark, the Eiffel Tower. But it wasn't always there, of course. Gustav Eiffel, the tower's architect, was commissioned to expose it during the 1889 World Fair. But the so-called Iron Lady was only meant to stand for 20 years. After that, it was going to be demolished. Except that, um, this plan was never implemented. The tower wasn't taken down because of an antenna built on top of the tower, and it conducts wireless signals. But there's a problem. The Iron Lady is made of iron. And with time and bad weather, which Paris happens to get a lot of, iron deteriorates. It rusts, and this rusting makes the iron weak, up until the point where it can crack. And if a tower that is made purely of iron starts to crack, you know what this means. No more selfies eating croissants in front of the famous Tour Eiffel. Apparently, French authorities are aware that this is happening, but instead of repairing the whole tower, they're kind of just painting over the rust. Your next stop is in beautiful Rome. You are here to visit, you guessed it, the Colosseum, one of the world's most visited monuments. The gladiators used to put on shows there. Well, you might as well say Arrivederci to it while you can. Like a lot of ancient monuments, the Colosseum is in danger of disappearing. It survived for almost 2,000 years since it was commissioned by Emperor Vespasian. But due to yearly exposure to harsh weather, the monument is getting weaker. The problem here is mainly snow. When snow falls upon the Colosseum, the freezing water infiltrates the cracks of the rocks and makes them bloat. You know, like when you put a soda can into the freezer and the bottom pops out? I know, snow is a kind of infrequent visitor in Rome, but even rare below zero temperatures can damage the Colosseum seriously. And since we can't control the weather, who knows how long we'll get to see this beauty around. After hopping on a red eye to India, you arrive at the unique Taj Mahal. It's even more mesmerizing in person than it is in pictures. The Taj is one of the seven wonders of the modern world, but why is it at risk of disappearing, you might ask? The monument was finished way back in 1643. It was made with pristine white marble as a gift from Emperor Shah Jahan to his beloved wife. But if our white shirts get dirty just by stepping outside the house, imagine an open-air monument that has existed for over four centuries. The Taj Mahal is located in the city of Agra, right beside the Yamuna River. Over the years, the region has become very polluted, and all of this pollution is helping to destroy the Taj. India's Supreme Court has been on the case for many years now, and they say the monument is turning greenish and brown. So, high authorities decided that either the local government restores the Taj Mahal completely, or they'll shut it down.
or worse, destroy it. For the good of humanity, I hope they decide to restore it already. Otherwise, we'll be down to only six wonders. Ah, finally, you've made it to South America. More specifically, you're now in the mountainous country of Peru. If you're not used to such high altitudes, you might get a little dizzy. But it's worth it to see the mesmerizing Incan ruins of Machu Picchu. The city is located at over 7,000 feet above sea level, and no one knows how the Incas built such a sophisticated village. That's why the site attracts around 440,000 visitors every single year. But since regulation is not so strict, the site is also slowly deteriorating. Machu Picchu may be the victim of something known as over-tourism. I mean, if you look at any footage from the site on a normal day, it's pretty packed up. And even if it's a stone-made town and stones are pretty resistant, they do suffer from erosion. Man-made or weather-made. Oh boy, I really don't like the sound of that. There's another stone monument that you need to check off your list. Can you guess which one it is? Yup, Stonehenge. Located in the peaceful hills of Wiltshire, England, Stonehenge has been around for over 5,000 years. Well, nobody knows exactly when it was built, but bear with me. If the only cause for disappearance would be erosion, then it would make the monument millions of years before it disappeared. But that's not the case. Since 1995, there have been multiple proposals from British authorities to build an underground tunnel that connects southeast and southwest England. The thing is, the tunnel passes underneath Stonehenge, and it might rock the site's foundation. Get it? Rock? Anyway. Since the project was suggested, local supporters of the monument have found a Save Stonehenge alliance to keep the monument safe. They strongly believe that any enterprise, such as this tunnel, will severely harm the site. Ah, Egypt. This time, to arrive at your destination, you travel in style. And by that, I mean camels. Just for the photo op, of course. But why are you here? You came to check out the Great Sphinx. You know, the one with the broken nose? The Sphinx was also built way, way back in the day. Try over 4,000 years ago. And back then, they used what they had at their disposal, limestone. Now, some researchers think that hazardous weather may be damaging the Sphinx's limestones. You see, they're very porous types of rock, so water easily infiltrates inside of them, making erosion stronger and faster. But water is also coming from down below. Unlike the Pyramids of Giza, the Great Sphinx was carved directly from the bedrock. And right underneath the monument, there's a riverbed, which also infiltrates into the Sphinx, making it weaker. Fingers crossed that Egypt doesn't get a lot of rainfall in the next few centuries. I hope you brought your swimsuit, because it's time to dive deep into the Dead Sea. Except that you probably won't get too deep, you know, since there's so much salt in the water that you basically only float. Fun fact, this sea is 10 times saltier than the ocean. It may be a little ironic that the Dead Sea is at risk of actually perishing, but it's true. The lake level is dropping 4 feet every year. It has to do with one of the sea's main tributaries. A tributary is a river that flows into a much larger body of water. The thing is, the region is not so rich in natural water, so some of the local authorities ended up diverting small tributaries for basic human uses. But since every action has a reaction, the Dead Sea is now facing some difficulties. Back in the USA, it's time to visit the city that never sleeps. And if you've understood this trip by now, you already know the landmark we're visiting. It's Lady Liberty. It may come as a surprise to some, but the famous Statue of Liberty was originally copper. It's turned green due to oxidation. I mean, maybe I would also turn green if I was constantly exposed to New York's harsh weather. Some researchers say that air pollution can also speed up oxidation processes, threatening the long life of Lady Liberty. Of course, New York City does its share of maintenance. Hopefully it'll be enough for us to keep seeing the statue during our lifetime. Hey, it's time to head back home. I sure enjoyed this trip. Hope you did too. Let's hope we can still visit these places. In some ways, the United States is a whole different world, totally different from every other place. 
So let's take a look at what's normal there that baffles people from the outside. One of the first things a foreigner notices when entering the country is flags. American flags everywhere. On buildings, like schools and houses. And on clothes, like shorts, t-shirts, you name it. Throughout history, Americans have changed 27 flags. The current American flag was only adopted in 1960 and is so far the longest lasting flag of the country. It wasn't created by the authorities though. In 1958, there was a contest for a design of the new American flag, and the winning flag was made by a 17-year-old high school student from Ohio. The reason why Americans love their flag so much is national pride. But why not so many countries do the same? Well, some countries avoid displaying them for historical reasons. Other countries only raise the flag on special occasions to highlight the importance of the event. Still, some countries display their flag as often as Americans do. In Denmark, people are quite proud of their flag too. They decorate the winter holiday tree and birthday cakes with them. And you can always find stickers with Danish flags, red and white candles, and other goodies with the flag in a grocery store. People in Sweden are also very much into their flag and have flagpoles everywhere. Now, let's go to a restaurant, shall we? Many things there are very specific to the states. Like, for example, tons of ice in every drink. Turns out there is some history to this preference. America has always had a lot of ice as a resource since New England's lakes and rivers have a lot of those during winter. Centuries ago, before refrigerators and other helpful cooling machines, that kind of cold resource was very valuable, and the states started exporting ice to other parts of the world and also, of course, consuming it themselves. They started to put ice in their hot drinks in contrast to the British, who were always drinking their beverages hot. The ice in the drinks has become an American thing, and it was also considered a rich person's drink. Yep, the ice would also show a person's status. Of course, with time, when refrigerators appeared, ice became available to everyone, and Americans started to add it to their drinks commonly. The habit remained, but also, ice drinks are very refreshing, which is especially important in the hot south of the country. But if you come from abroad and don't want your drink freezing cold, always specify it to the waiter. The next striking thing is the huge portions that are served, and there is a reason for that too. It wasn't always like this, but in the second half of the last century, due to pesticides and fertilizers, farmers started to be able to grow more food than they used to. The government caught on, subsidizing them to grow even more food. So, the amount of available food increased. Over time, companies started to increase the sizes of their portions. Why serve less food and get less money if you can serve a bit more and also charge more? That's good for business, and it's a win-win. Customers get more food for just a little bit more money. So, larger portions stuck. Okay, now we need to take a little toilet break. And, surprisingly, there are a lot of foreigners who find American toilets weird. First, what's up with those huge gaps in bathroom stalls? Let's start with the more obvious part, gaps on the bottom of the doors. Those are quite common, even outside the US, and they serve several purposes. First, you can see if there's a person inside without trying to break into an occupied stall. Second, it provides some ventilation and makes it easier to clean the floor in the bathrooms. The gaps on the sides are more questionable. Of course, people on the outside can't see everything going on behind the door, but still, there's not much privacy whatsoever. In most other countries, the gaps are either negligible or non-existent. So what's up with them in America? I did some research. Some sources say that since every inch of material is expensive, wide gaps are made to reduce the costs of bathroom stalls. Other sources say that when people feel exposed like this, they have fewer incentives to do something illegal in public bathrooms. Next observation, American toilets have way more water in their bowls in comparison to, for example, European ones. 
The reason is that those types of toilets use different flashing systems, and an American one needs more water to flush effectively. In many countries, especially in Asia, most bathrooms have bidets, which are used for after toilet cleaning, and tourists don't understand why Americans wouldn't adopt those too. After all, if you step in mud, you'll go and wash your foot instead of just wiping it off with a tissue. The same logic works here. Also, it reduces toilet paper usage. So it's more sustainable and it's environmentally friendly. Some say there's a strong stigma in America around bidets that is extremely hard to overcome. Others say that toilets in the US don't have enough room to install a bidet. So they don't have those, especially if there are other well known ways. Before we leave the restaurant, we need to tip the waiter. Tipping in the United States is way more common than in most other countries. You're expected to tip any service person who helped you with something. While some kind of tipping exists in some other countries, the extent of it is smaller. And there are also countries like Japan and Denmark where tipping isn't a thing at all. Those countries have minimum wage laws that dictate decent wages employers must pay their workers. This way, the need to pay money to service stuff isn't pushed onto the customers. By the way, here's one more fact about the prices. Probably the craziest thing in the States tourists have to adapt to are prices in stores. The tax isn't included into the displayed price and is added on top while checking out. So people who are short on money can't pre calculate the price they will have to pay to make sure that they have enough money. But really, why is it so? The main reason behind such a weird policy is transparency. This way, taxpayers know how much tax they pay and can resist raising the tax rate in case it comes on the national agenda. Also, it allows buyers to compare the cost of products across states fairly, since tax rates may differ. So, if the tax isn't included, you compare the actual bread costs between Alabama and Alaska, for example. In some places in America, it's not very easy to get around unless you travel by car. In some regions, there's often no sidewalk taking you to the closest convenience store or a crosswalk, allowing you to cross the road right in front of the store. The main reason for that is probably the fact that the United States is a big country with vast lands and everything is spread out. Neighborhoods can be scattered around. Wide suburban territories quite far away from one another, so that's already far from being walking distance. And sidewalks aren't needed because, yes, no one's walking. Studies show that Spanish or Germans walk at least twice as much as Americans. But in those countries, everything is way closer. And last and not least, you guessed it the imperial system. It's based on the human body. A foot is an average foot size of a person, so you might think it's quite intuitive for anyone. Well, no. Foreigners are incredibly confused with feet, inches, gallons, and Fahrenheit, and tend to convert it all to the familiar metric system. Well, in this sense, the British are even more confusing. Those guys use both imperial and metric systems. For height, it's mostly feet and inches, but for weight, kilograms. Great Britain used to have the imperial system. But later, they were forced to switch to the metric system. So now, they're using a combination. Whatever helps to be more precise. Not a lot of people have heard of this mysterious body of water named after famous English explorer Sir Francis Drake. Even though Drake himself never sailed through these waters, one of his ships did pass near this location and discovered a connection between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. That's how the area got named the Drake Passage in 1578. Soon enough, the passage became known for some mysterious disappearances. It got the reputation of being the roughest and most unpredictable stretch of water in the world. It's now known for its strong winds and rough seas with waves that can reach up to 60 feet in height. The passage also has powerful currents with speeds never seen before. Does it sound like a good start to an adventure book? Sure, it doesn't make the place any less real. If you ever decide to travel between the southern tip of South America and the southern tip of the Antarctic Peninsula, you will come across the infamous Drake Passage. We call this place the Drake Passage today, 
but locals still believe it should be named after Spanish explorer Francisco de Oces. He was a Spanish navigator who, in 1525, led the first known European expedition to navigate the Drake Passage. The trip was part of an attempt of Spain to find a new route to the Spice Islands in the East Indies. Oses and his two ships, the San Lesmes and the Santiago, sailed through the Strait of Magellan and into the Drake Passage, where they encountered treacherous weather and rough seas. Despite the difficulties, they successfully navigated the passage and became the first Europeans known to have done so. However, the expedition failed to find a new trade route and the crew returned to Spain with no significant discoveries. Some years later in 1616, another ship captained by Dutch navigator Willem Schouten made one of the most successful voyages through the Drake Passage. Despite the difficulties of navigating the often turbulent seas, eventually, the Drake Passage became an important part of international trade routes in the 19th and early 20th centuries. But this dangerous area holds many secrets. The record of one of the most famous events that happened here takes us back to the year 1914. During that time, a British explorer named Shackleton wanted to travel to Antarctica with 27 men split between two ships. Those were named the Endurance and the Aurora. The explorers wanted to check out two routes that reached the continent. But in 1915, the Endurance got stuck in ice while crossing the Drake Passage and was slowly crushed. Shackleton and his crew had to leave the ship and could only gather some personal belongings. The Endurance eventually sank and the crew had to survive on ice for a while. The mission changed from exploring to surviving and only in 1916 all the men were rescued. The Aurora suffered a similar fate. It also got stuck in ice and three men were lost at sea before the rest of the crew was rescued in 1917. For many years, the ship Endurance was thought to have been lost forever. But in 2022, a group of specialists went on a trip to find it. They left from Cape Town, South Africa on February 5th. The leader of the group said it was most likely the most difficult shipwreck search in history. They used special equipment to find the ship under the water and then used a special underwater camera to take a closer look. The members of the team were sure they had found the Endurance because it was in a place where very few ships had ever been. Despite being 10,000 feet underwater, the Endurance didn't look so shabby. It was actually pretty well preserved for a ship that had been underwater for more than 100 years. The explorers were still even able to see the word Endurance written on it. But it's not just ships that have a hard time with the Drake Passage. A plane with 38 people on board seemed to have disappeared over the Drake Passage in 2019, according to the Chilean authorities. It's believed it hit the icy and rough waters of the passage. Rescuers used ships, planes, and satellites to search for the missing plane and its passengers in the area where it had last sent messages. But the harsh conditions of the Drake Passage made the search very difficult. The exact location where the accident had happened was eventually found, but there were no survivors. The Viking Polaris is another of those ships that got damaged in the passage even though it was designed for tough conditions. It was faster than most ships and more stable because of special equipment that kept it balanced. One night back in 2022, the waves were indeed big, but the ship seemed to be doing well in the rough weather. But then on its way back to port in Ushuaia, Argentina, a rogue wave suddenly hit the ship without warning. People on board felt like they had been hit by an iceberg. Rogue waves are much taller than other waves around them, and they're very unpredictable. Scientists still don't know exactly why they occur. When this rogue wave hit the Viking Polaris ship, it immediately broke windows on the second deck. Some people on board were hurt, but thankfully, most of them had been properly trained before boarding the ship and knew what they had to do in case of an emergency. The crew was also very good at helping the passengers. Most of them even claimed later that they would board the ship for the second time despite such an unexpected experience. The boat eventually made it to the port without suffering further damage. What makes this region so hard to cross though? For starters, the Drake Passage is a wide and deep area of water. It's about 500 miles wide and has a depth of 15,000 feet. 
even the most experienced sailors who cross the passage every year say it can be dangerous, unpredictable, and even scary at times. And that's even considering the modern technologies we have today. The area is a mix of warm and cold temperatures, which can result in ravishing storms. Strong winds from the west push the water from the Pacific Ocean into the passage, creating waves and swells that can reach up to 30 feet or more. If accidents happen here, things can get ugly faster than anywhere else. The Drake Passage is a part of the ocean where the water is very cold and has strong currents. The bottom of the ocean there is also not stable, making it harder to find things like a plane or a ship. These days, we have modern technology that helps us feel safe, even when we're passing through rough seas. However, if you are planning to travel by boat to Antarctica, make sure you're ready for the rough sea in the Drake Passage and for feeling a little uneasy. This can happen even to the most experienced of people when the waters are rough, but it's especially tough if it's your first time. Some people bring remedies to avoid feeling sick, like ginger gum or scented wristbands. Others find it helpful to look at the horizon. Test things out to see what works for you. Once you arrive at the Drake Passage, you'll be surprised to see that lots of different animals live there. You can see many types of dolphins, birds, whales, and penguins. The water in the Drake Passage is also good for small animals like plankton, krill, which bigger animals such as whales, penguins, and seals generally have on their daily menus. As you get closer to Antarctica, watch out for the South Shetland Islands. These might be the first pieces of land you'll see. They're also located in the Antarctic Peninsula and were first discovered in 1819 by British explorer William Smith. The South Shetland Islands are home to severe active volcanoes, including Deception Island and Mount Fenton. The islands are also where you can find a number of endemic species, including the South Shetland Islands Gen 2 penguin, which is only found on this piece of land. It all started with the home insurance building that was built in 1885 in Chicago. Just a 10-story building, but it was a revolution at the time. And that was the beginning of the era of skyscrapers. It was constructed using a revolutionary method. The building had an inner skeleton made of steel, which allowed the walls to be thinner and the whole structure being higher than ever. It stood until 1931 when it was demolished to build the Bank of America that stands even today. That very same year, the construction of the Empire State Building in New York was completed. The Empire State is as tall as 10 home insurance buildings on top of one another. That's the construction progress humanity made in just 46 years. The Empire State became the tallest construction in the world and held that status for 39 years. Now, a bit more than a half century later, the Empire State Building is ranked 53 on the list of the tallest constructions. Humanity has climbed way higher. The tallest building in the world today is Burj Khalifa, located in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. It's 2,717 feet tall, more than two Empire State Buildings on top of one another. Even though skyscrapers started out in the United States, they became tremendously popular in Asia. Just to put it in perspective, around 80% of the skyscrapers that exist in the world are in Asia. And in total, the continent has over 7,500 skyscrapers. The country with the most skyscrapers is China, having almost 3,000 of them. Why do they like skyscrapers so much? Well, Asia has the largest population in the world and their economy is booming. So, growing high is a perfect solution to fit as many people as possible in its cities. But close to China, there's also India having almost the same population. Still, they have 10 times fewer skyscrapers, with their number being a bit over 200, and most of them being located in Mumbai. So why doesn't India build skyscrapers if it's such a great way to accommodate people? Turns out, the country strictly regulates the construction, saying that it's due to health and safety. 
You see, there's quite a popular urban theory that big structures that accommodate a lot of people lead to higher population density, more anonymity in the city, and lower safety in the territory. So India is trying to avoid it by building low. Problem is that when a city can't accommodate everyone who wants to live there, the cities start growing horizontally. One more thing is that the land and the apartments are very expensive due to their scarcity, so very few people can afford it. This way, India has started to loosen the restrictions recently and is now slowly allowing to build a bit higher. 34 skyscrapers are now under construction. Do you know what other place in the world refuses to build skyscrapers too? Europe. New York alone has more skyscrapers than all of Europe combined. There are just 250 skyscrapers in Europe, and half of them are in just three cities. Europe has a whole different reason to resist tall buildings. The history of skyscrapers goes back to just a bit over 100 years ago, to the 20th century USA. The USA is quite a young country, and the cities are still being built from scratch. There is a lot of available land. When the United States were being built, many European cities had already been around for dozens of centuries. There's not much more room for construction, and no one has any desire to take down the Colosseum and put some fancy skyscraper there instead. There was also no practical reason for changing things. The driving force of Asian and American skyscrapers is the booming population of the cities. Also, Europeans are very protective of their city skylines. The story comes to Brussels, the capital of Belgium, which even got the term Brusselization. In the 1960s, there were no zoning regulations and some buildings in Brussels were demolished to make room for more modern buildings to develop business districts. Uncontrollable construction started, and modern buildings were built in random places around Brussels. They had no cultural or historical value, and they didn't fit in the city architecture at all, messing up the city's image. Many architects and people protested, and new laws were introduced, restricting the demolition of buildings of historical importance and taking construction under control. Other European countries learned from Belgium's mistakes. Populations across Europe still dislike modern structures. Many cities adopted zoning regulations and building a fancy glass skyscraper in Europe isn't that easy. Still, cities with big financial centers like London, Frankfurt, or Istanbul require commercial space. So, in some cities, there are several skyscrapers somewhere outside the historic centers, forming separate skyscraper districts. Rome, the capital of Italy and one of the oldest cities in the world, rejected skyscrapers completely, stating that no high-rise will ever appear there. Also, have you noticed that most skyscrapers are made of glass? Turns out, the choice is not random at all, and there are several reasons to favor glass in their construction. The first one is that glass can be pressed in every shape possible. So, the skyscraper can no longer be just a plain, boring vertical tower as before. But all of these fancy designs we have around the world now. The second reason is that glass is a very thin material. The walls are thinner and the floors are bigger, providing more inner space, unlike in the pre-home insurance building times. Glass is also transparent. Glass reduces the need for electrical lighting inside the building, so it's also very cost-effective. Even more, glass is temperature and therefore weather resistant. And finally, it just looks posh, fancy, and modern. So, theoretically, skyscrapers maximize urban space, accommodate more people, and reduce energy use. In practice, everything is a bit less efficient. Skyscrapers have more space between them than lower buildings. So that already means more land used than we imagined. Also, around 40% of a skyscraper's floor space isn't accommodated because it's used for elevator shafts and emergency egress. Every additional floor adds less floor space than the previous one. As for the energy, 
Skyscrapers still require a lot of heat and cooling, and we shouldn't forget about the energy elevators use. Okay, let's find out what are the countries with the biggest number of skyscrapers in the world. I'll give you the top 15 as of September 2022. So, number 15 is Panama, with 66 skyscrapers there. Number 14, with 67 skyscrapers, is Turkey. 13th place goes to Singapore. They have 95 skyscrapers. Then there goes India, with 112 of them. Quite a few of those were built in recent years, so that's a big jump they made. Next up, 122 skyscrapers in the Philippines. Thailand opens the top 10 with 125 skyscrapers. Canada surpasses it a bit, having 126. Eighth place goes to Indonesia, which has 129. Australia is home to 141 of them and gets seventh place. Level up, now we're talking 266, and it's Malaysia. Japan beats it by just five and opens the top five. Number four is, no surprise, another Asian country. It's South Korea, with 276 skyscrapers. The United Arab Emirates make it to the top three with 314 buildings. Now, we all know the two countries with the biggest number of skyscrapers if you've been attentive today. Yes, the second place goes to the founding father of skyscrapers, the United States of America. They have 859 of them. That's a big jump from third place, but there's an even bigger one. With 2,976 skyscrapers, the first place goes to China. Nine countries in the top 15 are Asian. Three countries are from the Americas, one in the Middle East, one in Europe, and one in Australia. Let me continue my world tour, and now we're heading straight to Europe. Let's start our journey in Greece, a place with thousands of years of history. Even in modern days, there are still ancient ruins there that are being carefully preserved, and it's an interesting ride. The airport of Athens has a built-in museum with ancient artifacts. And here's how ancient and modern coexist there. Here's the view of the Acropolis from the street. A Spartan roaming the streets of Greece. A Redditor shared a photo of a modern building built right over the ancient ruins. The visitors can see the ruins through the glass. Greece is also very well known for its cats roaming the streets everywhere. This Redditor spotted a cat guarding the National Bank of Greece. These days, everyone is trying to reduce the usage of plastic. Some use paper straws and some go with glass straws. But this cafe in Greece offered to use macaroni as straws. I'm not sure if it's stupid or genius. Another user went to a restaurant in North Macedonia and got baffled when they served slices of pizza on waffles. Double win, a snack and no waste. In Romania, vending machines seem to be a thing. This one, for example, is a machine with ham. And here's a better one, a vending machine selling cartons of eggs. Scrambled eggs, probably. Europe is a place where old neighbors are modern, and this combination is mesmerizing. I'll show you. This Redditor shared a photo of a modern basketball court squeezed between 700-year-old walls in Croatia. And here's a photo from inside a grocery store. Look at these old columns. Modern problems require modern solutions. These traffic lights light up the ground so that people who store their phones could notice when the light changes. Italy is a work of art with thousands of years of history. I have quite a bunch of stuff for you from there. Some ruins date back thousands of years, and a lot of that gets preserved. A Redditor shared a photo of a lobby of a hotel that has a glass floor so that the ruins were visible. And these are the railing in an Airbnb. Even street signs are a work of art in Italy. Look at this one. Another Redditor shared even more designs. This Redditor showed a photo of a supermarket that is located in an old theater in Venice. Another user added one more photo of that supermarket. Since we're talking about supermarkets, apparently, pets are allowed there. There are even special carts to carry them. 
Cities are centuries old, and there are quite a few narrow streets, so post vehicles have to adjust to fit them. Here's one of them. Some cities have canals or are located on islands, so boats are a thing. This is a UPS boat at Murano Island. Europe is packed with countries. The city of Basel in Switzerland is located right on the border with France and Germany. So the airport has three exits. You can walk out of it to France, Germany, or Switzerland. Let's walk out in Germany. Look, there's a traffic light with a girl walking a camel. The reasons are a mystery to me because camels aren't really a German thing, but it's cute. Here's another unique street light featuring Karl Marx, a famous German philosopher. Back to baffling vending machines. In Germany, you can find vending machines with sausages. Hamburg is Germany's major port city. There's a river that connects it to the North Sea. No wonder there's a drive through McDonald's for a boat. Look at this design of mineral water that is being sold in the Swiss Alps. A Redditor brought a souvenir from France. These are baguette-shaped pens. Look at this narrow house in Spain. I wonder what it looks like inside, but unfortunately, the Redditor only shared the exterior. In Portugal, cell phone towers are disguised as trees. And this is a bus that can ride the roads and then turn into a boat. A Redditor spotted doors in London that have doorknobs in the center. This seems super inconvenient, but apparently the handle doesn't turn and exists only to pull the door closed. And the metal part with the keyhole has a little handle on the bottom of it. Europe is a historical place. This post box bears the mark of a king ruling over a century ago. Back in the day, red telephone boxes were in high demand. Nowadays, when every person has a cell phone or two, not so much. So telephone boxes are being used in different ways. This one, for example, is now a smartphone repair shop. Luxembourg is a small but rich country squeezed between France, Germany, and Belgium, and they have baguette vending machines. Let's move north first to the Netherlands. Farmers border their fields with a strip of flowers and put up a sign with a QR code where people can pay for picking the flowers. And here's just a weird installation spotted by some Redditor. In Denmark, in Aarhus, a city founded by the Vikings in the 8th century, you can find traffic lights with Vikings pictured on them. Some trash cans in Swedish subways have a separate space for cans. Homeless people can pick them up and exchange the cans for some cash. There's a giant statue of a silver moose in Norway. And these are signs on bathroom stalls depicting reindeer. Apparently, Finnish people are as polite as Canadians. On the bus, they have a button to thank the bus driver. Also, a Redditor spotted a raccoon pattern on a bus seat. We all know rocking horses. Most of you probably had one in your early days. Well, Finnish little people have rocking moose. Many people come to Iceland hoping to see the northern lights. A Redditor had a phone in the hotel which had a special button to wake the guest up when the northern lights appear. Lithuanians sometimes put fake police cars on the sides of the road to combat road speeding. Europe has been ruled by kings and queens for centuries. Even today, many countries like the UK, the Netherlands, Spain, Denmark, Belgium, and some other countries have monarchs. So, no wonder that there are hundreds of castles scattered across Europe. Poland doesn't have any monarchs these days, but it still has 500 castles. Here's a warning sign for ghosts next to one of them. In Wrocław, all landmarks have a model so that visually impaired people could touch and see them too. There's also a statue of Darth Vader in one Polish city. In reality, it's a statue of a Polish magnate who supervised the construction of a port. But from time to time, locals dress the statue in Lord Vader's costume. This sign in Poland specifically prohibits bikes, tractors, and horses to go on a highway. In some places, there's a separate line on the sidewalk for people who are walking and staring at their phones. And now we travel across the Atlantic to Africa. This is Dune 7 in Namibia the seventh biggest dune in the world. 
It's as tall as the Empire State Building. An internet user shared this photo. Someone in Tanzania put a literal penthouse on top of the building. I did some research and found out that it's a hotel. Still doesn't explain the roof, but I'm totally buying it. Maybe it's marketing. Drivers in Mozambique should be careful and watch out for elephants. And this is a sign from South Africa. Watch out for penguins. And another one that asks to baboon-proof the trash bins. So baboons are the raccoons of South Africa. Trees growing through the roads aren't surprising anymore. But this is a palm tree in Morocco growing through multiple balconies. A Redditor shared a photo of a runaway horse in Israel returning to the backyard in an urban area. Urban horse encounters are relatively common in the country. A hotel in Turkey served a whole honeycomb for breakfast to this Redditor. Welcome to Starbuck Island in the middle of the Pacific near French Polynesia. Even if the name brings to mind a strong coffee smell, you will find no Frappuccino there. The island is uninhabited. It's also pretty tiny, just 5.5 miles east to west and about 2 miles north to south. The island is so small, New York City could fit in 18 such islands. Seems like there can be zero interesting things, but… Google Maps have something to surprise you. A couple of months ago, there was a viral TikTok video about a weird saucer-shaped object found on Google Maps on Starbuck Island. The video racked up over 5 million views in two days. The creepiest part is that there's a long streak traversing almost the whole island. It looks as if someone had to break with all their might but failed, and it resulted in a crash of that saucer-looking vehicle. Could that be another possible proof that we aren't alone in the universe and someone tried to visit us and couldn't drive very well? All these speculations are blood-chilling, and the users believe no one knew the true story behind those traces and the saucer. Little did they know that back in 2009, a group of explorers visited the deserted island. They made a couple of videos that were uploaded to the net. Thing is, the island didn't used to be that deserted. In the 19th century, Starbuck Island was used for guano mining. A tiny clarification here, guano is bird and bat droppings. Yeah, droppings mining doesn't sound quite convincing. But guano is rich in phosphates, and phosphates have a lot of uses and can be used as fertilizers. So, since there were some people on that island, they had to construct a sort of temporary settlement, which they did. Now, back to Google Maps. Do you see that angle? Right. The satellite picture can be compared to the pictures and videos made in 2009 by the explorers. Another point proving that this weird object has a terrestrial origin is that there are some trees on the island, which is bizarre. These trees aren't native to coral limestone terrain, and they were definitely planted by people. Mystery solved! The saucer-shaped object is not an extraterrestrial vehicle, but what remains from a settlement. And the traces stretched out across the island? Eh, who knows? But it's definitely nothing out of this world. Another TikTok user claimed they saw zombies on Google Maps. Let's see if this one is true. First off, the video scared over a million people who watched it. This TikTok starts with a view from afar, and as the user zooms in, we understand we're in Finland. Then we see an inscription. Uh, all right, I surrender. Finnish viewers, help me out here. The next thing we see is a low-quality Google Street View image, and that shot sends shivers down my spine. It looks like a mass gathering of people, but they don't look quite alive. The image looks foggy and bewildering. Are these real zombies? Sure thing they're not. First off, let's deal with the inscription. It translates to English as a quiet people spatial artwork by this person. So, he is a Finnish dancer and choreographer and intended the Silent People artwork to be part of his performance. But now it's an independent art piece. Fun fact, the Silent People figures get changed twice a year, in the fall and at the beginning of the summer. They get all the clothes from donations. Bang! Another myth debunked. Right side 2, TikTok Myths 0. Right, now take a look at that pic. Anything weird you've noticed? Right, it's a three-legged girl. The satellite picture was taken in Croatia, but there's nothing to worry about. These are nothing but Google Maps issues. Thing is, 
The technology used for Google Maps purposes has a curious algorithm. Each object gets photographed several times, and then the resulting photos are stitched together to achieve the most accurate image. In most cases, it works, but sometimes it seems like the technology tries too hard, and it results in extra details and sometimes extra limbs people have in the photo. And if we're going to have a three-legged race, then I'd bet on her. There's nothing that can escape the all-seeing satellite eye, right? On September 20th, 2022, a TikTok user posted a video about a plane found underwater on Google Earth app. The plane was found off the coast of Crooked Island in the Bahamas, not far away from Colonel Hill Airport. Now, let's see if that's true. The first thing we should keep in mind is that even Google Earth help themselves admit the fact that the pic found in the app may be the result of several photos, either satellite or aerial, taken on different days and even in different months. The result of stitching might sometimes be a bit unpredictable. Remember the three-legged girl? How could we forget? So, as you may have already guessed, this photo is nothing but stitching. The area with that plane was photographed multiple times in 2004 and 2005, then it was photographed eight times in 2015 and a couple of times later. The most probable reason for this photo being on Google Earth is that these are the 2015 shots combined together. They say the reticulated python is the largest snake in the world and can reach a whopping 20 feet in length. There's a record of one such python found in 1912 that reached 32 feet in length. However, users found an even more staggering snake on Google Earth. On March 24, 2022, another mind-blowing video was posted on TikTok. The video got over 200,000 likes. Imagine the views! This time, the user claimed that a mega-skeleton of the extinct Titanoboa was found on Google Maps somewhere in France. It was hard to judge from the image, but the skeleton was estimated to be about 100 feet long and could have certainly been the longest snake that ever existed, if the snakes had had such a skeleton in reality. So it's the number one reason why this one is not a snake. You see, snakes have somewhat thinner ribs, And the skeleton in the picture looks way more massive. Another curious thing about this skeleton is that it turned out to be made of steel. See what I'm driving at? It's not a real skeleton, but a stunning 425-foot-long art installation. It's called this French name, which means ocean snake in French. The installation was created by a Chinese artist, Huang Yongping, and it's free to visit. The cool thing about this installation is that it only appears with tides, so it looks like a real archaeological excavation. Well, the artist made a monkey out of millions of users. If you ever travel to France, you can go check this extraordinary piece of art. It's located in this place, not far away from that place. Sometimes, Google Maps show something that never existed. Meet Sandy Island. For a long time, it was believed to be located near New Caledonia in the Eastern Coral Sea. It all started when Captain James Cook included it in the charts back in 1774. He never visited it, but it was later included in several more charts as a precaution against reefs. At the time, it was standard practice. Plus, the area was, and is still, swarming with pumice sea rats. These are the masses left after an underwater volcanic eruption. So, such a precaution was a necessity. This way, the island stayed in the charts until 1974. A flying recognition campaign claimed there was a lack of appearance of that island, and Sandy Island was deleted from the charts. Google Maps appeared back in 2005, and the island, surprisingly, was there, even though it had been previously undiscovered. It got removed from Google Maps only in November of 2012. Now, there is nothing but black pixels. But there used to be a darkened sea area. Today, some specialists believe the whole situation with the island was just a copyright trap, which was a popular practice among cartographers back in the day. Those traps help cartographers protect their intellectual property. So, have you ever seen anything weird on Google Maps? Behind those huge steel doors is one of the most guarded places on Earth. It's known as Site R, or the Raven Rock Mountain Complex. You'll find it in Pennsylvania. The construction is 60 stories underground. and is said to be a safe place for people in case of a natural or human-made disaster. 
There's not a lot of information online about this mysterious place, but what we do know is that it's equipped with 38 communication systems. It's obviously not available for visits via Google Earth, but you can catch a quick glance at the two gates that face the complex. Vatican City is one of the most famous enclaves on Earth, and it's certainly worth a visit due to its wonderful architecture and vast list of art pieces to check out. One place, however, will always be off limits for visitors, the Vatican Secret Archives. They have some of the oldest and rarest books on Earth. These archives are available only to a limited number of people, and since they have been visited by a small number of people so far, they also trigger a lot of weird theories. For example, that there may be books proving there's life outside our planet. If you're fascinated by shipwrecks, you'll be interested to know that one of the largest wrecks you can see on Google Earth is on North Sentinel Island, India. It used to be called the SS Jassim. It was a Bolivian ferry that sank in the area back in 2003. The reason why people can't visit it physically isn't because of the ship itself, but because the island is home to the world's most dangerous tribe. We don't really know how many people live there, but it was estimated that between 50 to 400 people call this place home and they really don't like tourists. No person that tried to reach them survived. Also, to protect them, their privacy, and their special status, the island is closely monitored by the Indian authorities. That's mostly because it's believed the locals don't have any immunity to modern diseases. So being in contact with foreigners might be dangerous for the tribe's people, since they've never seen the outer world. A huge pink bunny appeared seemingly out of nowhere in the Italian Coletto Fava Mountains back in 2005. Besides the locals, some people stumbled upon it online too. They were puzzled by the discovery. Unfortunately, that 200-foot tall bunny is completely gone today. You can still find the images of it online though. The unusual object was designed by artists from Vienna. They encouraged tourists to climb, jump, or even take a nap on top of the large rabbit. The whole purpose of the project was to allow people to experience what it would be like to live as smaller creatures. The bunny didn't have any removal date at the time it was placed there and was expected to last at least until 2025. But Mother Nature had other plans. A Japanese artist decided to move back to her little home village named Nagoro. But she soon found out that most of her neighbors were moving to bigger cities. To deal with loneliness, she started putting together scarecrow-like dolls, or kakashi and placing them all over her garden. She didn't stop there, though. The artist soon began doing the same with many other places in her village, creating dolls and placing them as if they were taking part in various human activities. These dolls keep moving around, too, but the woman likes to stay true to her story and insists she doesn't touch them. You can see the images of this quirky village on Google Maps. This weird portal was discovered via online maps in New Baltimore, New York. It gave people all sorts of bad dreams. With spooky-looking buildings and all sorts of blurry figures, this area soon became a source for many weird internet theories. Turns out it was nothing more than a technical issue, which resulted in those images being rendered in a distorted manner. Either way, if you look for these images on Google, you won't be able to unsee them. This cute miniature world map was created by an artist from Denmark. He continuously worked on this tedious project from 1944 until 1967, using mostly his hands and just a few tools for moving heavy rocks around. He gathered stones at the edge of the water, then recreated the map of the world on the surface of this lake. During the winter, he was able to use a sled to transport larger pieces of rock over the ice and then place them in the perfect position. Apart from the continents themselves, the map also features rivers and lakes, as well as some other famous landmarks. Care to have a look at a sea without any coasts? Search for the Sargasso Sea. You'll find it in the northern Atlantic Ocean. This weird sea is surrounded by four ocean currents and no dry land at all. It got its name from the seaweed that grows there, Sargasso. Fingerprints on the lens of a satellite camera? You may be tricked into thinking this if you search for the finger maze. It's located in the city of Brighton, UK, and is a large fingerprint created in Hove Park. It also has a maze at the center. It can be really hard and time-consuming to look for wild animals on Google Earth, but the Geo Browser does have a nice feature that can help if you're eager to see hippos and flamingos in their natural habitat. Try Googling animals from above and start scrolling through these images. This unique feature can take you from Kenya to Namibia and even all the way to Antarctica, where you can see emperor penguins. 
There are some places on Google Maps that, for specific reasons, aren't available for the online public. Like the Royal Palace in Amsterdam. If you head over there via Google Earth, you'll see that everything around the Dutch Royal Palace is still visible, like the vegetation and roads. But the construction itself is blurred from all angles. That's probably because local authorities want to keep the unique views of the palace for the eyes of physical visitors only. The same goes for the Tantaco National Park in Chile. This one is a privately owned nature reserve that can only be seen on Google Maps from a distance. Once you reach a certain point, the zoom feature stops working. Some people say that since it's a nature preserve, it may be home to some endangered species, and extreme measures are taken for their protection. You know how a certain brand of fried chicken has a certain kernel on their logo? Yeah, you won't see any of these logos in high resolution on Google Maps. That's because the online map uses specific algorithms to detect people's faces and blur them out. As you can see, it's not always really that accurate. It's called Snake Island, and the Brazilian authorities prohibit people from visiting it. For good reason. You'll find the island near the city of Sao Paulo in Brazil. It's said to be home to over 4,000 snakes. Some of the most venomous types of reptiles on Earth call this place home. If that's not creepy enough, how about that some of them are so dangerous that a small drop of their venom can permanently damage the human skin? You can see the shape of the island on Google Earth, but the more you zoom in, the blurrier it becomes. Here's another cool thing you can do on Google Earth. Time travel. Well, at least sort of. You won't be able to travel back in time and tell yourself to study more for that tricky exam, but you can see certain historical images of places you like. You can check if this feature works by looking at the upper left corner of the screen. If you can see a small icon with a clock, it may allow you to scroll some years back but you can also see how sunlight affects Earth if you turn on the sunlight feature. Bright, colorful flashes of pink and green light up the sky. You're watching it from your backyard in Pennsylvania. That's not something you're used to, but it's very likely to happen more often in the near future as the northern lights are shifting south. Northern lights, or auroras, appear as a result of solar storms. The sun is a huge ball of molten gases that are constantly moving, so such storms aren't rare. Our star produces a huge amount of energy that goes our way. It travels as electrical charges at the speed of about 3 million miles per hour, no big deal. When all those tiny particles from the sun reach Earth's atmosphere, they give some of the energy to atoms and molecules in its upper layer. The atoms and molecules can't hold it and give it off as light. You can see it as spectacular auroras around the magnetic poles of the northern and southern hemispheres. If you were watching them from space, they'd look like large ovals. The brightness, colors, and shapes auroras take depend on the altitude where the lights are formed and what particles take part in the process. In the northern hemisphere, locations like Alaska, Canada, and much of Scandinavia normally get to see the brightest lights. The biggest solar storm ever was recorded in 1859, and it was so powerful that the northern lights were spotted in Cuba and Honolulu, and southern lights were seen as far up as Santiago, Chile. In latitudes like that of New York, people were able to read newspapers in the dark under those northern lights alone. If something similar happened today, it would have caused $1 to $2 trillion in damage. With solar activity and pressure from the solar winds increasing, the Aurora Belt's borders are currently shifting south. Solar activity goes in cycles, each of them 11 years long. We're now in solar cycle 25, which started in December 2019, and will reach its maximum strength between November 2024 and March 2026. So, geomagnetic storms will become stronger and probably even reach G5 levels. Those levels are their strength ratings. For you to see the northern lights south of the Great Lakes, a storm must be rated at least G3. G5 storms will be able to produce auroras that will even reach Florida. In case you don't want to wait for the sun activity to peak in 2025, head north if you're in the northern hemisphere, or south if you're in the southern hemisphere. Auroras down there are known as the southern lights, or aurora australis. It doesn't have to be cold for you to see the northern lights, it just has to be dark. Auroras are active throughout the year. You can't see them from April to August in the northernmost parts of the world because it's light 24-7. It's also important that there isn't any precipitation or clouds in the sky. Those will block your view. 
Light pollution won't help either, so move away from any cities. Try to get to an elevation to maximize your chances of spotting the lights. They can appear in a whole variety of colors, including white-gray. The green-yellow part you're most likely to imagine while thinking of the lights is just the easiest to spot with an unaided human eye. Sometimes you might not see the lights at all, but your camera will still catch them. They might seem dangerously close to Earth, but the closest the northern lights ever get to us is 50 miles. For comparison, planes normally fly at around 6 miles above the surface, and that already seems like a lot. The distance from Earth defines the color of the auroras. When atoms giving us this spectacular show collide closer to Earth, you can see blues and violets in the sky. Green and red auroras are born further away from our planet. Earth isn't the only planet to have northern lights. Jupiter and Saturn both have strong magnetic fields, and scientists spotted auroras up there using the Hubble Space Telescope and the Cassini and Galileo spacecraft. It looks like Saturn's auroras are also caused by solar winds, but it's not so clear about Jupiter. Despite what you can often see online, the northern lights aren't going to disappear altogether. Once the sun passes its activity peak and becomes less active, both the northern and the southern lights will happen less frequently, but will still be gorgeous. Another beautiful rare phenomenon is called the green flash. It happens shortly after sunset or before sunrise when the sun is almost entirely below the horizon, and the Earth's atmosphere bends and scatters light from it. People mostly spot it over the ocean. It can also be yellow, blue, or purple. About once a year, you can spot a rare fire nado in the U.S. Fire tornadoes start when a strong wind picks up heat from a fire. They are made of a flame or ash. They're different from regular tornadoes because they don't start from cyclones. Fire nados are about as tall as the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Unlike fire nados, fire rainbows or rainbow clouds don't cause any damage at all as they don't have anything to do with fire. You can only see them when the sun is very high in the sky, and its light is passing through ice clouds, so they're pretty rare. The rainbow halos are just as unique. Again, it takes a specific type of ice crystals in the clouds of the surface of the Earth to bend light from the sun into a perfect ring. The same thing can happen with moonlight. The only difference will be that the moon halos are usually white, and sun halos can be rainbow colored. A white rainbow is another rare illusion, this time created by fog and water. Like a usual rainbow, it's formed when light is shining through droplets of water. It loses color because fog droplets are hundreds of times smaller than those of rain. A white rainbow is sometimes mistaken for a moonbow. You can spot this one at nighttime as the moon illuminates it. That's why it's not so bright. If you ever see an upside-down rainbow in the sky, that's a circumzenithal arc. It's not really a rainbow, but a kind of halo like those around the sun or the moon. This optical phenomenon is caused by ice crystals in the upper atmosphere. You have the best chance to see a circumzenithal arc when the sun is rather low in the sky. It happens super rarely, but it can rain without a single cloud in the sky. It's sometimes called a sun shower because it looks like the rain is falling straight from the sun. In reality, rain clouds are at a distance from that specific location. With sun rays being angled, the clouds become out of sight. Then, it takes just a little wind to blow the rain in your direction. If you ever travel to regions with high altitudes, you might see something called penitentes. Those ice spikes form only in a really cold and elevated environment where the air is dry. The sunlight turns ice directly into vapor instead of melting it into water. That's why these blades of snow and ice up to 15 feet tall start to pop up on the surface of the Earth. One of the rarest types of clouds is lenticular clouds that look like giant mountain hats. They're formed when moist air travels over a mountain or a mountain range and gets into an area of turbulence. Volcanoes can produce bolts of lightning. They're formed in columns of volcanic ash through friction and static electricity to connect the positively and negatively charged particles. To understand how it works, you can rub a balloon across your hair or your feet across a carpet and then touch a metal doorknob. Once a year, just for a few moments, a waterfall in Yosemite turns into a fireball. In winter and early spring, 
two streams flow down El Capitan Mountain in perfect conditions in February when the sun is hiding behind the horizon. It gets into the right position to reflect off the wall and color the water into fiery orange. The coldest part of our planet, Antarctica, keeps surprising us. Take a look at this waterfall named Blood Falls. Reddish water falls from the white ice. Scientists concluded that the color is related to iron. The water coming from the glacier oxidizes and rusts when it's exposed to oxygen, and the red color occurs. Step on Mount Gandic. It lays eggs. Well, maybe not real eggs, but the stones certainly look like dinosaur eggs. That's why the mountain got its fame. The, let's call them stone eggs, formed in one part of the mountain over 500 million years ago. Interestingly, this phenomenon repeats once every 30 years. Eggs come out in various sizes and shades. The stones appear on the surface of the cliff. A study made in the area has revealed that the composition of the stones of the cliff isn't similar to other parts of the mountain. Here, calcareous rocks rule. They're more prone to erosion. They ripen off day by day. It took three decades for the stones to get to the egg shape. Yet, it's still a mystery how these rock formations can be so perfectly spherical and smooth. According to scientists, every stone egg has an organic core. They're made of shells, plant remains, fish teeth, and skeletons. Maybe this has something to do with it. Gulu Village is close to the stone eggs. Locals believe that these eggs are sacred. Villagers associate it with good fortune. In fact, nearly every family has one of these eggs in their house. Unfortunately, there are only about 70 eggs left, so if you want to see them, you gotta hurry up! The Rich Hat structure is a circular geological phenomenon in the Sahara Desert near Mauritania. It's made out of rocks in layers, and these layers look very much like rings. No wonder the unique structure even got NASA's attention. Up from the sky, the geological feature seems to be swirling and spinning. Scientists are still not sure how these rings got there. Some say it was an asteroid impact. Many others believe that it was a natural geological process. To them, the Rich Hat structure is an uplifted and eroded dome. Geologists often classify it as a domed anticline. The scientists discovered that the rocks at the center are older than the ring-shaped outer rocks. So it seems like the stones have been eroded to flat rock layers. Anyway, there's no valid explanation for this phenomenon, and the 28-mile-long mystery of the Sahara is still to be solved. Number 4 is Rapa Nui, or Isla de Pasqua. But I bet you know it as Easter Island. Yeah, it's got three names. It was discovered by Jacob Rogovine, who actually never intended to look for that island. He just casually landed there one Sunday. That's where the name comes from. Jacob was supposed to find Terra Australis. Disclaimer, it's not Australia. This one never existed and was nothing but a hypothetical continent. Plus, he wanted to peek at Davis Land, which was believed to have once been seen by Edward Davis, the pirate, not Edward Davis the saxophone player. Jacob failed at that too, though nobody ever saw that island except for the pirate Davis. Jacob may have failed to discover some lands he wanted to, but he discovered Easter Island instead. This is an island and special territory of Chile, located in the southeastern Pacific Ocean. It's on my list because nearly 1,000 stone statues called Moai were found there. They were created by the Rapa Nui people. Nearly all statues represent gigantic heads, but there are also a small number of figures kneeling with their hands over their stomachs. Each statue represented chiefs or other important members of Easter Island society. To curve those statues, the locals used volcanic stones that were softened. Our next stop is the gateway to the underworld. Nah, don't worry. This is just how people labeled Darvaza gas crater in Turkmenistan. This giant natural gas crater has been there for five decades. This crater is continuously burning gases. The president of the country wants experts to find a way to extinguish this continuous firing pit. This site was created by people accidentally in 1971 while working on a natural gas project. Ever since then, the flames have been on and it's become a tourist attraction. Mysterious constructions are sometimes built in our era, too. We don't have to go millions of years ago to long-gone civilizations. 
Edward Leedskollen single-handedly built a structure called Coral Castle in Homestead, Florida. He didn't use any large machinery. He carved and sculpted more than 1,100 tons of coral rock in 28 years until 1951. It's a mystery how he managed to do it all by himself. Leedskallen sculpted the sedimentary rock into different objects, such as walls, tables, chairs, a fountain, and a sundial. There's of course a legend behind this mystery too. He was inspired to build the structure after being abandoned by his fiancée on their wedding day. Uh-oh, runaway bride! Well, he wanted to prove his love to her and the world, so he wanted to do something extraordinary. Well, he definitely nailed it! Now, let's talk a little bit about the mystery of the Namibian fairy circles. There are millions of circular patches in hundreds of miles, ranging from 10 to 65 feet in diameter. They're called fairy circles because they look like a fairy or an otherworldly creature made them. These are essentially oval-shaped soil surrounded by grass. There are a lot of local beliefs surrounding the creator of these marks, yet science says something else. Biologists and mathematicians have been puzzled by the mystery of the Namibian fairy circles for decades. There is more than one theory to explain this phenomenon. Here's one popular theory. The water is limited in the desert, so plants compete to reach the water. Some plants expand and thrive into a patch, but smaller plants nearby cannot get the necessary water to live. In the end, some vegetation disappears, and the remaining ones stay at the patch's edges. That's why they form such regular distant gaps. What if I tell you that there is a hill in Leh wow. City, India, where instead of rolling downwards, things roll uphill? It's an optical illusion. The road looks like it's a sloping hill because of its surrounding landscapes, yet the road actually goes down. These kinds of hills are called magnetic hills or gravity hills. Scientific explanations vary. The most common theory says that the hill has such a strong magnetic force that it can pull cars in the vicinity. Now, how about seeing some flaming rocks? Yanartash spread over an area of over 3 square miles. The place is located on a rocky mountain in southwest Turkey near the town of Chiaralea. Yanartash got its name from its appearance. It literally means flaming stone. The rocks have been flaming for at least 2,500 years, and they'll probably keep burning for the coming decades. The mountain where the rocks are is an inactive volcano, so it's full of tiny fumaroles that release gases such as methane. The gas ignites when it comes into contact with oxygen and creates the flaming effect. Uh, and by the way, back in the day, sailors used the flames as a natural lighthouse, as it's really close to the sea. Today, it's more of a tourist attraction, though. Hikers love it, too. Now, walk on this frozen Lake Abraham in Canada. In winter, the frozen water gets filled with ice bubbles. It looks magical, but these white orbs aren't that safe. They consist of flammable methane gas. Ew. Beauty can be misleading. The next one is from Racetrack Death Valley, USA. There is a dry lake bed with moving rocks. Now these odd rocks look as if they've been pushed or dragged by someone or something. They leave both a trail and a mystery behind. The force behind all this is now understood. Surprise! It's the wind and some ice. Scientists say the wind pushes the rocks during brief windows when the soil is covered with ice. Now, I can't help but notice that many mysterious things on Earth involve stones or rocks or methane. Which one of these phenomena is your favorite? This spiky tree knows how to shoot, so you better stay away from it. It's called a sandbox tree, and you can find it in Amazonia. Initially, its seeds are formed in the shape of a small pumpkin. As time goes by, they harden and mature. But here comes the fun part. Just as they reach peak maturity, the seeds pop and shoot out at a speed of 150 miles per hour. They can even reach distances of 60 feet. That's what makes it so risky to be in their way during the blast process. Not to mention the seeds are poisonous too. Sure, some trees don't grow completely upright. But a tree that's altogether bent, with its branches even touching the ground, is a sight not to be missed. 
Such a tree, called the El Arbol de la Sabina, grows in Spain. Its shape depends on the wind, as the tree bends in its direction. As a result, not only does it often have a weird shape, but it can also change it completely during different times of the year. This flexible tree can reach more than 26 feet in height and tends to grow in the most improbable of locations, like on rocks. Now, how about a tree that's as old as dinosaurs? Discovered in 1994, the Wallamy pine tree species can be seen in the Blue Mountains of Sydney, Australia. It dates back to over 200 million years, so it's easy to believe dinosaurs might have even roamed around it. Since these trees are endangered, and only 100 exhibits exist to this day in the wild, the scientists don't feel like disclosing their location. They want to make sure the trees are well-preserved. Also, they're important for science, as studying them may help us uncover new information on the Earth's past. The bark of the tree can teach us many different things, like different temperature periods or exposure to various chemicals. The tree of life gets its name because it's able to withstand difficult conditions and actually thrive. Located in the desert outskirts of Bahrain, the Prosopis cineraria has a very deep root system, which allows it to survive in the scorching heat. The scientists still can't find out how it manages to get sufficient water. It's so special that it gathers over 50,000 tourists each year. La India Dormida in Panama is a mountainous area that's shaped like the body of a sleeping girl. It's part of a bigger, mysterious region called La Val de Anton, one of the largest inhabited dormant volcanoes in the world. And it has some pretty weird trees, too. Square ones. Even the rings of these trees, meaning the interior of their trunks, are the same shape, with sharp edges, sometimes even at a perfect 90-degree angle. Researchers have tried to piece together why these trees grow in this particular shape. They even tried taking samples of some of the trees and planting them elsewhere, to see if they retain that shape. It wasn't the case, so it's clear that the odd shape of the trees has something to do with the valley itself. Some people believe that a local farmer might have originally planted the trees in boxes, forcing the trees to grow like that, to reduce lumber waste, since round trees often end up being cut in sharp angled pieces. One of the oldest and biggest trees in the world is found in the Sequoia National Park of the United States. It's called General Sherman and stretches at 275 feet. It's almost as big as the Statue of Liberty. Its circumference is equally as impressive, as near the ground, it is around 102 feet around. As for its age, we can only guess it to be between 2,300 and 2,700 years. It's an old tree! (laughs) There are a lot of beautiful species of trees out there, but none as striking as the rainbow eucalyptus found in the Philippines. It almost looks hand-painted because of its multicolored layers of bark. This tree also shades its layers irregularly, which means it shows a lot of colors at once, from green to blue, then purple to orange, and then finally reaching brown. It's not used for decorating purposes, but rather for paper manufacturing. Located in Namibia is a tree that's also weird in shape and pretty dangerous, the bottle tree. Okay, in terms of shape, it's pretty self-explanatory, with a round trunk that narrows down toward the top. But the milky sap harvested from the tree is extremely poisonous. Legend has it that local hunters used to dip their arrows in it for added efficiency. It does look really beautiful during bloom season, with flowers that grow in pink and white with a red center. Now, to see a crooked tree every now and then isn't so special. But to see a whole forest of them, you'd have to travel to the Polish town of Grafino. Near it, there is a forest made out of 400 oddly shaped trees. They've been curved with mechanical intervention. They didn't just grow like that, but their purpose remains a mystery to this day. Some have said it's because the wood from the trees was intended for furniture, or even for the construction of boats. But either way, the forest was eventually abandoned. A silk cotton tree has taken over the ancient Ta Prom temples of Cambodia creating a spectacular view. The massive branches of the silk cotton trees were free to grow over the structures for ages, going back as far as the 12th century. The temples have been restored and are accessible to tourists. 
The dragon's blood tree grows in the Canary Islands of Northwest Africa. Locals used to say that once a dragon passes away, it transforms into a tree. Standing at an impressive 50 feet in length, the tree is named like that due to its red sap, which can be harvested from the bark. The red substance to this day is used for dyes and in medicine. One of the biggest, oldest, and most impressive trees in the world is the Sunland Baobab tree. It's 72 feet high and has a circumference of 155 feet. It's located in South Africa. What makes it even more spectacular is the fact that it is naturally hollow inside. So, a small lounge was set up inside the tree back in 1933. It initially could support up to 20 individuals, but it can now host up to 60 people. Not to mention, the tree dates back over 6,000 years. The silver birch tree spread across Scandinavia and Northeast Europe and found a way to reflect light. Its bark became lighter in color, and during the colder season, when its branches also freeze over, the site is something of a natural winter wonderland. It also developed a partnership with a fungus that connects to its roots and fans out under the forest, gathering up nutrients that trees can't reach. For these services, the tree gives the fungus sugars in return. The birch's companion is dangerous and shouldn't be consumed by people. It's easy to recognize with the classical scarlet-topped red-sprinkled mushroom head. A natural festival not to be missed is Japan's cherry blossom season. The pinkish-white blossom is deeply rooted in Japanese culture, going hand-in-hand with a local saying called mano no arare. Was I even close on that? Which relatively translates to the fact that everything is temporary, regardless of how perfect or beautiful it is. Should you ever visit Japan, you'll quickly see that the cherry blossom symbol is everywhere, from company logos to even clothing or household items. Yosemite National Park in California once had an amazing tree structure that was turned into a tunnel. It was a coast redwood tree, stretching 227 feet tall. It was nicknamed Wawona, the Native American word for the hoot of an owl. The tree fell in 1969 because of a heavy snow, but it survived as an ecosystem for animals, plants, and insects. It's now called the fallen tunnel tree. One tree species known as Fercapa's vivervet, well, you read it, is the rarest plant on Earth. The Guinness World Record book recorded one single tree of its kind off the coast of New Zealand. It wasn't always that lonely, but humans brought goats to the island, which nipped at every other member of its family. Ow! Luckily, scientists are looking at ways to plant new specimens. You find yourself at a food fair in Iceland when you see it for the first time. Volcano bread! You eat a slice and oddly enough, it actually tastes good. Unsure of how this works, you check out Mm -hmm. the baking process. Hmm. Is this kitchen really strange looking, or is it just me? The baking spot is in nature, specifically in a hot springs field. You better watch your steps so you don't get burned by the hot vapor jolting from the ground. Now, a local baker shares their traditional rye bread recipe with you. Rye flour, check. Yeast, check. You mix it all together and pour it into a metal pot. Next on the list is digging the hole where you'll place the pot to bake. You dig for about 16 inches until you can see the water bubbling from the ground. If you want to do it like a local, you'll use your finger to check the water temperature. Yikes! That's hot! Actually, the ground is heated by lava. Iceland is one of the most volcanic regions in the world with over 30 active volcanoes at any one time. After you bury the bread in volcanic soil, you leave it there and wait 24 hours until it's ready. The next day, the bread is fully baked and super tasty. Ah, and the best part is, you just participated in an ancient Icelandic tradition. People have been doing this since at least the 1800s. Imagine it's your first day of work in a museum, and your assigned task is to clean the mask of Tutankhamun. You grab your cleaning utensils and then, oh no, this can't be happening. You just broke Tutankhamun's beard. I never wish this to happen to anyone, but this is actually a true story. Back in 2014, an employee at the Egyptian museum knocked off the beard of Tutankhamun's mask and glued it back on, hoping no one would notice. 
This mask was discovered in 1922 and is considered one of the 10 symbols of our human civilization. Oh, and the best part of this story? It took historians until 2016 to discover the poor glue job. So, if you visited the museum between 2004 and 2016, maybe you saw the glued beard. If I say Sahara, what comes to mind? An infinite desert landscape, right? Well, according to scientists, the Sahara isn't always a desert. From time to time, it becomes green. But you probably won't be seeing this in your lifetime. Every 10,000 years, the Sahara lives through a humid period, where the sand gives way to lush green vegetation and sparkling lakes. This happens due to a tilt in the Earth's axis, which affects different weather patterns around the globe. Can you imagine the Sphinx surrounded by rainforest? It's mind-blowing! And speaking of the Sahara, say you traveled back to 1800 BCE. If you timed it right, you might get to see the construction of the so-called Black Pyramid in the city of Dashur. These are not the famous Giza pyramids, but they serve the similar purpose of being a final resting place. In 1892, archaeologists excavating the area found an important part of the Black Pyramid that was lost for centuries. The Benben, also called a Pyramidian, was the tip of ancient Egyptian pyramids. A Benben consists of a solid block, usually made of limestone. Most of them were covered with gold and reflected the first rays of light from the sun every day. Hmm, can anyone get me a time machine, please? Remember when you ate something really spicy, your cheeks turned red? Apparently, that can happen to birds, too. For example, canaries can change colors after eating peppers. These birds have a special pigment that allows them to switch shades depending on their diet. So, if a yellow canary eats red peppers, it can turn orange or red. Can rocks move on the ground on their own? Well, you might be under that impression if you visit Racetrack Playa in California. The site is a dry lake bed and home to one of the world's strangest phenomena, the so-called sailing stones. Think 100-pound rocks moving around alone, leaving behind trails as long as 1,500 feet. They were discovered in the 1900s, and until recently, no one was lucky enough to be on the site while they were moving. It was only in 2014, after much observation and research, that scientists solved this mystery. The sailing stones appeared because of the perfect balance between wind, ice, and water. When it rains, the water that falls on the ground freezes and forms a coat of ice above the ground. If it's windy, the rocks are easily pushed around, sailing along the lake bed. But hey, if you ever visit Racetrack Playa, don't disturb the rocks. On the western coast of France, you'll find the vacation hotspot known as the Island of Ray. It attracts tourists looking for scenic landscapes and beautiful beaches, but that's not all it's famous for. There, an extraordinary phenomenon occurs when two different wave patterns collide with each other, something called a cross sea. It's almost as if the sea were a checkerboard divided into hundreds of squares. And no, it's not an optical illusion. A cross sea only happens in places where different quality waters meet. For a tourist to see the cross sea in Ray, this probably means that there was a storm in a different sea nearby. This stormy water travels with the help of currents and meets the water of Ray, creating these oddly shaped riptides. Oh, and apart from this island and Israel, there's nowhere else in the world where you could see such a thing. The following site will either give you goosebumps or make you marvel at its weirdness. I'd say it depends on the time of day you visit. Next to the small town of Grifina in Poland, you'll find a very unusual site, a pine tree forest where each tree is bent at its base. If you visit during the daytime, I guess you'll be fascinated by these trees' sharp 90-degree curves. You can even use their trunks as a stool if you decide to have a picnic, for example. But visiting the site at night will most likely give you chills. A thin layer of fog hovers around, making the forest seem quite unwelcoming. Scientists still can't explain why the trees are the way they are. So, are you a daytime or nighttime visitor? You went for a hike and suddenly encountered a big cloud of fog. This may ruin your photo ops, but there's one thing you can hope for. Foggy days are the perfect conditions for a phenomenon called 
fog bow, otherwise known as a white rainbow. This happens because of numerous tiny water droplets that cause fog, smaller than 0.002 inches. So, instead of the multicolored bow, you get a transparent one, with red outer edges and a bluish inner edge. Now, say you're roaming in a little town in Europe, appreciating the century-old buildings and good summer weather. You feel hungry and decide to type into your Google Maps the name of that restaurant your friend recommended. Ah, it's only 10 minutes away by foot. You follow the blue dot on your GPS and arrive at your destination, quick and easy. We all love this free piece of technology, don't we? But what if I told you that the US spends over $2 million daily to maintain the satellites to make it work? Yep, that's the price. And to implement it, they spent over 12 billion US dollars. Have you ever heard of something called a natural snowball? This could be proof that nature is really perfect. In 2016, the beaches of the Gulf of Ob in northwest Siberia were filled with rows of giant snowballs. Think balls measuring up to three feet across. This rare yet beautiful natural phenomenon happens when small pieces of ice are rolled by strong winds and water. The further they roll, the more ice they gather and the more that ice is polished. They end up as giant, perfectly shaped snowballs. They look pretty amazing on their own, but it's quite a sight when hundreds of them are together.